Okay, number six. So six says, a researcher adds a sample of 30 rats that are all cloned from the same source. The 30 rats are genetically identical and have been raised in exactly the same environment since birth. The researcher <coughs> conducts an experiment randomly <coughs> assigning 10 of the clones to treatment A, 10 to treatment B, and the other 10 to treatment C. All right, so we, have a we understand what's happening here. We're doing an independent group's design, right, between subjects design, with 10 subjects in each condition, and they're all clones. Right? So these rats are identical in every way they could be, genetically, environmentally. These are basically 30 copies of the same rat. <laughs> All right? Why, now, just off the top of your head, I'm telling you we've got clones. What should that make you think about when we talk about research? Why would we want clones? What, what do we not have any of if we have clones? Individual differences, right? Individual differences always cause problems when you have people who are different, right? There's stuff about them that's different from other people. What's up with that? But we have to deal with it because we study people. That's what we do. But if I could do a study and I could do it on clones, I would now no longer have to worry about individual differences at all, which would be pretty spiffy. Okay? <laughs> so now, as you know, individual differences. What? Okay. So to explain why the cloning experiment is better than a between subject study using 30 regular rats that are randomly assigned to three treatments. Okay, so now we're just saying 30 regular old rats with individual differences, <sighs> contaminated with difference. Okay, 30 regular rats randomly assigned to three treatments. Okay, it says, in other words, explain how the clone experiment addresses the primary challenge of creating an effective between subject study. So what's the primary challenge of creating an effective between subject study? That's the problem, what's our challenge? What do we try, what do we have to do? Create groups that are similar as possible. That's right, we have to make groups that are as similar as possible, right? And the thing that makes that hard is those individual differences, right? Our number one challenge is creating groups that are similar enough to compare from the beginning, right? That are made up of different subjects. And how does this solve that problem? Can our subjects get any more alike than they already are? Nope. So by using clones instead of regular rats, we have eliminated individual differences as an issue, and so our three groups are effectively the same group, right? These are basically the same group of rats over and over and over again. Okay, so the primary challenge is giving everyone... It's creating groups that are similar enough to compare statistically. Getting groups that are made up of different subjects to be similar enough to compare. Okay. That's the number one challenge of a between subjects design. It's creating groups of different subjects that are similar enough that we can compare them. Because if they're too different from the beginning, if I find a significant difference at the end, I don't know if it's because of my manipulation or if it's because they were already different. So it would be a compound. So in order to eliminate that compound, I have to make sure that my groups are as similar as possible from the beginning. And if I'm using clones, done. Fortunately, we don't have human clones that we can do research on. Plus the results wouldn't generalize to everybody else, right? We need to have variation in our subject groups, some variation, because there's variation in the world, right? So, all right. The next one says, explain why the clone experiment is better than a within subject study using 10 regular rats that are tested in each of the three treatments. In other words, explain how the clone experiment eliminates the primary challenge of creating an effective within subject study. What's the primary challenge of a within subject study? Managing sequence effects. Managing sequence effects. That's right. We have to worry about sequence effects. Because in a within subject study, every subject is experiencing every condition. And you have to worry about sequence effects. Things like carryover effects and learning and practice and all that other stuff. Because that can mess up your data. So how do we solve the problem with this? Why don't I have to worry about sequence effects if I use clones? They're all the same. No, that's why it's good for between subjects, but that's not why it's good for within subjects. Because it's three separate groups. Because it's three separate groups. So my subjects aren't experiencing more than one condition. 
As a result, they can't experience any sequence effects. So I don't have any sequence effects to experience. There are no sequence effects to be experienced because each group of rats is only experiencing their condition. So if I had a magical world where I had cloned rats, I could solve the main challenges of experimental design, both between and within. Downside, I can't learn very much from cloned rats that would help me with people. Because right? even though I have met some people who I would characterize as rats, <laughs> fortunately they are not the majority. right? And people are different, and we need to study people that are different. I'm not sure I understand the explanation. Okay. For which one? So the number one challenge of a within subject design is dealing with sequence effects, right? That your subjects are experiencing conditions in, in, in some order and that they could learn something from one condition that affects how they respond to another condition. But the experiment I'm doing is taking 30 clones and dividing them evenly across three groups. So each group is only experiencing one condition. As a result, my clone study eliminates the problem of sequence effects because there is no sequence. No rat experiences more than one condition. So I have no problem. Does that make sense? So it's better for between subjects if I use clones because there's no individual differences. So now I know my groups are totally the same. That's great. And it's great for within subjects designs because I don't actually have to use multiple conditions for each subject, right? Each subject can just experience one condition and it's just like it's experiencing all of them because they're clones. But again, this would only be really fantastic if people were a lot like clone rats and they're not. So we have to learn how to deal with individual differences because the reality is people are different. So if we're going to do research, I mean, this would kind of be like people saying we should do all research only on white, heterosexual, Judeo-Christian men between the ages of 18 and 22. Mm -hmm. And that will tell us everything about all people. How many people in this room fall into that category? <coughs> there you go. So, see? Nobody in this room would be represented by that very super simplified group, right? It would eliminate individual differences in a lot of ways, right? But it's not going to tell us about the real world. So. Yes, it solves design problems, but you know, just because it solves design problems doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. You need data that's actually going to be useful. Okay. So next problem. All right, here we go. Seven. Here's the one everyone freaks out about. All right, the researchers investigating the relative effectiveness of two different weight loss programs, conveniently named Program A and Program B. <laughs> Participants will be assigned to one of these two groups or to a wait list control group known as control. Okay, now, as soon as you see that wording that says, will be assigned to groups, what alarm bell should be going up in your head? It's going to be randomization somewhere, and it also means between subjects design. This is an independent group's design, because that's when we assign subjects to groups. And when we assign subjects to groups, it's because we have different groups they could be in. So you should be thinking, this we're talking about between subjects design. So it says, here are the weights in pounds for the 18 participants who have volunteered to be in the study. Participants are listed in the order that they arrived at the laboratory. Now, this should sound familiar. Subjects coming to a laboratory with weights. What should this make you think of that we've already talked about in class? That's right. Purina. Chunks and lumps. Kroger kibble and Purina one. So there's a handout on randomization and matching that I gave you that will provide you a very good blueprint for solving this problem. So if you don't have that handout out, I recommend that you get it out because it's handy to look at it as we talk about this problem. And this is just how I tend to do things. I'm never going to throw you to the wolves and not have given you clues about how you can solve this problem. So um, that handout will be very helpful as we think about how to solve this. So it says first, 
randomly assign participants to the three groups using block <coughs> randomization. And if you look at that handout I gave you, what's the first thing I had you do with those dogs? It says, random assignment via block randomization, right? Right there on the handout, first thing I have you do. So what do we need to do? If you're going to do block randomization, what's the very first thing you have to generate? Create block. You need blocks. Mm -hmm. And what's a block? A, B, C, or? C, B, A, or? B, A, C. So we need how many blocks? Six. 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 Because that's how many we could possibly have, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can take some blocks. If we use the exact same ones that are on the handout, that when we did the dogs, they would be in order A, B, C, B A C, C B A, A C B, B C A, and C A B, right? So A B C, B A C, C B A, A C B, B C A, and C A B. Okay? Six possible orders of those three things. Okay? So I've got blocks. Now I'm going to use those blocks to assign my 18 people to groups. And the easiest way to do this is just start here at the top and say, all right, person one, well, my first block was A, B, C, right? <coughs> so person one is A, person two is B, person three is C. Done. What was my next block? B, A, C. B, A, C. Okay, well, person four is B, person five is A, person six is C. What was my next block? C, B, A. C, B, A. All right, then person seven is C. Person eight is B, person nine is A. Okay, does that make sense? Do you see what we're doing? Just mapping those block orders onto the people as they come into the laboratory. And if I do that, I will end up with six people in A, six people in B, and six people in C. Okay? Now, people who worked on this problem you went ahead then and calculated the mean weights for the people in each condition. So what did you get when you calculated the weight for all the, for the six people you assigned to A? What would you get? Did you add it up? Add up their weights? You're like, we did it, but we can do it really fast right now. No, we did it. We just did it differently. We did it wrong. Hmm? <laughs> you did it wrong? Yeah, because we started, we put them going 1 to 18 from the highest weight to the lowest weight. So you were matching them already. You did matching. That's the next step. Okay. You got to wait to do that. <laughs> All right, well then let's do it. Come on, guys. You can do it. It's not hard. Okay. A, B, C, C, B, A, B, A, C. What's this one? Here, let me put this up and I can actually write on the board. Okay, almost. A, B, C. C, A, B, what was the next one? Uh, that one was B, A, C, for the second one. Oh, this was B, A, C? <coughs> yeah, B, A, C, C, B, A, A, C, B, A, C, B, B, C, A, C, A, B. Okay, so these both here at the top are both A's, I just, I'm not going to write on the wall. That'll screw it up. So the top one is 313, and this one is 293. So add them up. Give me an average for A, B, and C. Do we have an average for A? 285.7. 285.7? Yeah. That would be good. If we add up the A's, 313, 277, 292, 293, 269, and 234. Right? The A's are 313, 277, 292, 
293, 269, and 234. If we add those up, what do we get? And then what's our average? 279.67. We have confirmation on that? 279.67. Okay. Now the B's are going to be 256, 247, 280, 301, 275, and 215. Two sixty two point three. Do I have confirmation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so it's two sixty two point three oh. Three three. Three three. We're running two decimal places for practice. All right, and C would be two eighty eight, two sixty two, three hundred, two fifty three, three eleven, one ninety eight. Two sixty eight point six seven. Do I have confirmation? Two sixty eight point six seven. Somebody else get that? Yes. When we do math in here, I don't do the math. You do the math, and then we get confirmation. Hopefully, because you know, if you just let one person in here do the math, if they do it wrong, everybody writes down the wrong number, and nobody knows what's going on. The chances that four people in here would all do it wrong exactly the same way is pretty low. So confirmation is a good thing to practice. All right. So. Look at these groups. So these groups are six pounds apart. This one is 10 pounds over this. Look how much difference there is here. When you, we do randomization, these groups are pretty different. If you're talking about a diet study, do you want one group to be 17 pounds heavier on average to begin with when you start the diet? That doesn't seem like a good plan because we're trying to have groups that are similar as possible. So we're going to try the next thing, which is matching and see if that helps because we've only got 18 subjects that's not very many so it may be that a matching strategy would help us out so let's take a look all right so it says the next thing is now randomly assign them to three groups using matching and there's a typo on here and the next one d this should say 7c not 10c i changed the numbers so you can rewrite it on your handout and i'll fix it in the online version so it's not confusing um, so now we're going to do it with matching now what do i do with matching Order. Put them in order, right? Okay, order people. Now you did this, right? We put them in order. We put them in order from the heaviest to the lightest, right? Okay, so if we're looking at all these people, well, who's my heaviest person? Person A. 313. One. Person one. one. A is different. Yeah. 313. Who's my second heaviest person? 311. Okay. Who's my next heaviest person? 301. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a list now from heaviest to lightest. All right. Now the group, you guys already did this, right? You figured out what the order is. So can somebody read them out to us from the top? From 313, read them nice and slow so people can write them down. 313. 311. 311. 301. 301. 300. 300. 293. 293. 292. 292. Then the... Keep going. Next group, uh, 288. Okay, 288. Yes, one, no, there is 198. Wow, that person's so light. All right, 198. <laughs> Smelt. Okay, so that's 18, right? In order from top to bottom. Okay, now we're going to create groups. How big are our groups going to be? Three. Why three? Because we have program A, program B, and the control group. Okay, so we're going to create groups. So on your list, now I want you to go, where you have 313, 311, 301, that's the top three, right? Draw a line. Separate that group <coughs> off. Then mark off three more. Draw a line. Mark off three more. Draw a line. Mark off three more. Draw a line. 
Huh? Already did that. I know you did that. <laughs> That's why you're my TA. All right. So you've done that. Okay. Now we're going to treat each one of those groups. We're going to randomize each one of those groups. Okay. So our first group, 313, 311, 301, right? And we're going to use, just for convenience, let's use the same random order we used for the first group before, first three people before. That was A, B, C, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means 313 is going to go in A, 311 is going to go in B, 301 is going to go in C. Mm -hmm. Now, who are my next three people? B, A, C. Okay, so that's going to be B, A, C. And can someone tell me the weights for the next three people again? 300. 300, 293, 293, and 292. 292. Okay. Now there's something important going on here. We have to randomize. Okay. What we don't want to do is just go A B C A B C A B C A B C because you know what's going to happen? The heaviest person in each group is going to end up in one condition, and the second heaviest person is going to end up in B, and the lightest person is going to end up in the control group every time. You don't want to do that. We need to distribute the individual differences of weight across the three conditions as evenly as possible. That's why we have to randomize after we match. Okay? What's my next three? CBA. CBA. Okay, and what were the pounds for CBA? 288, 288, 277. 288, 280, and 277. Okay. So you guys see what we're doing here? Make sense? Same block orders. Now instead of randomizing them as they come in the door, we're randomizing them after we put them in order by how heavy they are. All right, now we can go ahead and do that whole thing, right? Our other orders, we have those from before. Now, you guys did this, right? You already did this one. So what did you get for group A when you did it with this matching strategy? 268.17. Okay, and what did you get for group B? 272.33. And for group C? 270.17. So if we do that, okay, if we do the matching procedure, look how much more even the groups are to start off with. Now they're within five pounds of each other. There's no 17 or 18 pound difference. Now they're within five pounds of each other. And if these are like most people, their weight over the course of the year probably fluctuates within five pounds anyway. So this is probably within a normal amount of variation. Now, if you use different random orders, so for example, if you don't use ABC first, and then BAC and then CBA and so forth. Say so you mix it up. It makes no difference which random orders you use. You've got six to work with. You can do them in any order. Okay. Your numbers might be a little bit different, and that's okay. The important thing is, is that in the vast majority of cases when people do this, what happens is they find that when you do matching plus random assignment, you get more evenly distributed starting weights than if you just do random assignment. And that's because the sample here is very small, only 18 subjects. Random assignment works best when you have a large sample to work with. So when you have hundreds of people, random assignments works great. When you have 30 or fewer people, you really have to think about whether doing a matching procedure first might be helpful. Are they close? Okay, so let me show you. So if we look at the worksheet part for this, you'll see that I actually give you space on the worksheet. Let me put this switch it off, switch over here. Okay. So I actually give you space on the worksheet to put your blocks. So the worksheet actually gives you hints about what to do. I love visual cues. So the worksheet says, look here, you can put the blocks. Like you literally say, I'm doing A, B, C. And then do A, B, C, right? So then put the weights in, and then I ask you to kind of tell me what you did. Because it's good practice to try and explain it in words. Because you can think it that you get it in your head, but you really only get it when you can explain it in a sentence or two. 
So for each row, I looked at the block and I assigned the people to a group depending on where they were in the block. So for block A, B, C, I assigned the first person to program A, the second person to program B, the third person to program C. And I did the same thing for all the rest of the blocks. Okay. And the reason that I want you to do this is because this homework, if you get it right, is a great tool for studying, especially when we, start, we get to the final and you can't remember how to do any of this stuff, and you've got your homework that's right. And you can look at it, right? Because you don't get to keep your test, but you do get to keep your homework. So the more work you do that you've saved and for posterity, and we check in class, study sheets for the final, yay. Okay, because I don't do study guides. These are them. All right, so then, you, I, then the next thing is put the weights in. So then you put in the average weights. Then I say, okay, do it again, now do it with matching. And explain what you did. Now put in the weights, okay? And then it says, compare the results for the different assignment strategies. Which one do you think worked best and why? And the correct answer, at least given the data we came up with, was matching worked better because it's made the groups more similar from the beginning in terms of starting weight, which is important for a diet study. Done. Make sense? Everybody okay? Yes? All right. All right. Let's see. What's our next choice? Our next choice is... Oh, I think this is what people want to play with. Okay. Number nine, this is the one on threats to internal validity. All right, so it says, so threats to internal validity, what's going to help you on this one is the list of threats to internal validity or table 11.1 .1 in your book if you have the pink version, and I don't know what the table number is. If you have the blue version, but maybe 10.1? I don't know. Um, it might okay. be 11.1 it's chapter 11. It's 11.1 in the pink book, but oh. in the blue book, the older edition, the chapters weren't split. So um, I'm not sure which one's going to be. Okay. So it says, for his senior thesis, Jack was interested in whether viewing alcohol advertising would cause college students to drink more alcohol. Like they need something to cause them to But okay. He recruited 25 seniors for a week-long study. On Monday and Tuesday, he asked the participants to log into a secure website and record how many alcoholic beverages they had consumed the day before. On Wednesday, he invited them to the laboratory where he showed them a 30-minute video interspersed with entertaining advertisements for alcoholic products. On Thursday and Friday, he took the follow-up measures. Participants logged into the secure website again and recorded their alcoholic beverage consumption. Jack found that the students reported drinking more after seeing the alcohol advertising. He concluded that the advertising caused students to drink more. Now, you should all be going, alert, 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 threats to internal validity, problems with the study design. Gut feeling first. Tell me what you think about the study. Why might we need to be concerned? It says one thing causes. Well, he's saying, he's doing an experiment. He's trying to establish cause. He, he's, he thinks he's done it. My question is, has he? He only used seniors. He only used seniors, but if you're talking about college students, seniors are the most likely to be legally old enough to drink, right? Freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, you're talking 18, 19, 20, right? So seniors is actually probably a pretty reasonable target group because you're talking about they have to be legally old enough to drink. So that's not too bad. It was only a week long. It's only a week long. Why would that be a problem? Weekend could be an issue. Okay. Drinking different amounts towards the beginning of the week. Yeah, do you think people drink the same on Monday and Tuesday as they do on Thursday and Friday? I mean, if they drink, not everybody drinks. But, I mean, like, Monday night, are you like, I'm going to go home and have some pictures with my friends? No, but Thursday and Friday night, you're probably like, I'm leaving school early to go start working on that, right? So, his pre test was Monday and Tuesday. His post-test was Thursday and Friday. Do you think people are going to drink just normal drinking patterns? College seniors are going to be drinking the same on Monday and Tuesday as on Thursday and Friday? Especially if you're a senior freshman at night. <laughs> freshmen aren't supposed to be drinking at all. I also wanted to say that he just left the data twice, which is like... All, this is what, what we call, this is a, a single group pre-test, post-test design, right? They talk about this in your book. 
So big <coughs> problem he's got going on here, no comparison group, right? So he doesn't know if this group is anomalous or not because he doesn't have any control group that doesn't see the videos. He doesn't have anybody who doesn't see the video, so how does he know that the change is caused by his manipulation? He has no way to know that. He needs a comparison group. Okay? That's the first thing he's got to do is get a comparison group. Yeah? What about he recruited? What, like, how did he recruit them? Is that could be. I mean, yeah, you've got people who could probably like every other study, almost every other study at university, this is a convenient sample. This okay. is who was willing to volunteer, so we're not going to worry too much about that. But I'm really concerned about the design feature here where his pretest is at the beginning of the school week and the post-test is at the end of the school week. Because I think just in terms of common sense, people do not drink the same on Monday and Tuesday as they do on Thursday and Friday. You know, I mean, think about it. You don't see the people on Monday and Tuesday hanging out in the plaza, hanging out their booty party cards, right? They're out there on Wednesday and Thursday trying to get people to the booty parties, right? You know what I'm talking about? The guys who stand on the stairs and they pass out the cards with the naked women in thongs going... <laughs> she's going to be there. Yeah, I guess she's told, she's, all the women who go are going to look just like that. And um, what I love is when I walk into the plaza and the guys are like handing out the cards and then I get there and they like step back like... <laughs> they're like, we don't want you at our booty party. It's like, that's okay, I really wasn't planning on going anywhere, but you know. <laughs> but you know, you know how they litter the whole plaza with the booty party cards? You're just like, really? Like, you know, that, that, that's what people are supposedly doing on Thursday and Friday, right? Is going to booty parties. And I call them that because that's all you see on the cards are these women's boots. Covered in oil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're covered in oil. They're wearing a lovely outfit of oil. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, and like, small pieces of cloth or stars that are photoshopped in, right? Something like that. <laughs> it's very classy, very sophisticated for seniors. Okay, so but then those are all happening on Thursday and Friday, right? Those parties are not happening on Monday night. They're not happening on Tuesday night. That's when you guys are working, right? Thursday and Friday, that's when the parties happen, right? So I think that that's a concern. So no comparison group is a problem. Um, that the time... He would be much better off if he gathered pretest and post-test data on the same days of the week. So if he did Monday and Tuesday for pretest one week, and then he asked them for Monday and Tuesday uh, post-test the next week. Or if he had them give him data Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for their drinking, then showed them the videos, then did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And, and, you know, but he needs data from roughly the same time each week because people's drinking habits tend to be different over the course of a school week. Now, if this was summer, it would be a totally different story. But we're talking about, you know, everybody's in school. So something like that. So he, I don't think he can make the claim that the advertising caused the change because we don't know if it did. Maybe it did, but without a comparison group and without truly comparable pre-test, post-test conditions, we don't know. Plus, I have a sneaking suspicion he's got a little bit of observer bias going on here because he wants the results to show that he's right. He seems to have set up the study so that it will make him look right. That's not good. That's not. That's that's a problem with internal validity too. Yeah. Uh, could you argue that it could also be caused, possibly be caused, or like there could be a difference because of the time during the semester because there are exam times. And then there are times when it's mm -hmm. a little more lax. End of the semester, beginning of the semester. Sure, it could be that this, we don't even know for sure if um, this finding would generalize across different points in the semester. Because I think people do probably party a little bit more at the beginning of the semester when classes aren't so hard. But when you get around midterms, some people say, oh no, that's when I really party because I'm so stressed out. Or around finals, I'm totally partying because I'm just like, okay, maybe you're graduating, maybe you're not. I would suggest you wait until after finals. But, um, yeah, it could be that people drink differently over the course of the term. I know that after midterms are over, people tend to relax a little bit more and feel more like they could go out and party. But if you've got a bunch of hard tests and papers all at one time, you're probably not doing as much partying as a senior. You're probably trying to get it done because you want to get out. Right? But yeah, that's totally possible too. All right. In a cognitive psychology class, oh god, five minutes, we can do this. 
Uh, a group of student presenters wants to demonstrate the power of retrieval cues. First, the presenters ask the class to memorize a list of 20 <coughs> words that they read in a random order. One minute later, members of the class wrote down as many words as they could remember. On average, the class recalled six words. Second, the student presenters told the class to try sorting the words into categories, color words, vehicle words, and sports words, as the words were read. The student presenters read the words again in a different random order. On the second test of recall, the class remembered on average 14 words. The student presenters told the class that the experiment demonstrated that categorizing helps people remember words because they are able to develop rich mental connections to the words. What do you think? Yes, hands in the air. What do you think? That showing them the list just in a random order of the same words that you can memorize more. That's right. So we got a testing effect, right? Testing, retesting. So this is a learning effect, right? It's a sequence effect. Um, so we've got an effective testing here. What do they need to do instead of giving them the same list of words? Twice. They need two lists of words, right? One that they learn the first time, where they just read them in a random order, and the other one, a totally different list of words that then they're told, okay, now try categorizing the words on this list and see how you do it. But when it's the same list, duh, I mean, if I read a list to you in a random order and said, how many do you remember? And then I read you in the same list again and said, how many do you remember? Surprise, surprise, you remember more. Duh. So yeah, exactly. We got effective testing. Anything else they could have done? They did this as a within subjects design. Yeah. No, go ahead. Hands in the air like you don't care. Do it. <laughs> um, it's a psychology class. Yeah. So they know what to expect. Yeah, there could be. They might not be naive here, so they may already have some idea about what they need to do. There could be some subject reactivity here. They might say, oh, okay, you know, this is a memory test, so the first time do a bad job, and the second time do better, right? This is our friends, we want their, their thing. All right, so they could actually be changing their behavior to make their friends look good. Because we do that, right? We help our friends out, maybe. Yes? Would that fall under selection or demand characteristics? That would be demand characteristics, where the subjects have some clue about what it is you want them to do, and so they try to change their behavior to uh, to give you the response that you want. They could also, I mean, they could switch this up. They could change it and do it as a between subjects design, where one class hears the list of words, and another class hears them with the instruction to categorize and compare, right? But here, because they've done it as a within subjects design, they have to worry about that sequence effect, which is why they have to change the list of words, otherwise it won't work because if you get testing effect. So again, I'm just asking you, when I give you a little story like this, to come up with maybe one, one or more, maybe one or two things, and then be able to explain it. So on the test, I might give you a little profile like this, and then say, come up with one threat to internal validity, and I'd like you to come up with one of the 12 from the list, and then be able to explain why you think that's a threat. Okay, does that make sense? We're okay? All right, so for our next class, we're going to continue going over this, but my goal is that everyone will have tried to answer all the questions. You don't get scored online for getting everything right. You get scored for trying every problem. Okay? So even if you're wrong, try. And if you can't figure it out, in the blank, tell me why you can't figure out the problem. I'm totally stuck. I don't understand what you mean by this thing. Can we please make sure we go over this? Okay? So try to answer, put something in every blank that you upload, and if you get your assignment uploaded before class next time, class once. Thank you. I'm just going to ask when the drop box. Does it doesn't close at all? No. Okay. But we want them in before class. Because the goal is for everybody to have tried to do everything, because when everyone's tried it, then we still go faster. And then your job will be to go through and check and make sure everybody did. Yeah.